thirds to grading those with special needs, endorsing violence against political leaders, and further victimizing those who have suffered unimaginable trauma is absolutely repugnant and is unbecoming of any member of Congress. However, the action the majority is taking today raises questions that have nothing to do with Congresswoman Green, but concern the institution as a whole, which is why I feel that this hearing is premature and should instead uh, first be adjudicated by the Ethics Committee. Proceeding down the current path establishes a new standard, not only for what members of Congress say uh, before they are elected, but also what rights the majority party has to dictate the committee assignments of the minority members. Throughout the history of this institution, majority and minority have respected the right of each side to assign their members to committees. And it's also been the responsibility of each side to hold their members accountable for unacceptable behavior. In my opinion, there have been plenty of instances of members of the current majority party using intemperate language or taking controversial actions. Actions, I will add, that went unchecked by Democratic leadership. As was then and is now, if one side feels that the other is not taking the appropriate corrective or punitive action, the Bipartisan Ethics Committee exists to adjudicate matters related to the official code of conduct. This would certainly be an appropriate course of action in this case. The Ethics Committee should review the matter in question, determine if a new standard relating to actions taken by a member of Congress before they are elected should be covered by the code of conduct, and make the appropriate recommendations. Doing anything different would risk sending the institution down a precarious path, and the end of which uh, we cannot predict. So I would strongly urge this committee to consider an alternative course of action before it's too late. Let me just add this, if I may, Mr. Chairman, on a personal note. I've sat on Republican study committee, or steering committee, excuse me, for many years. I've had to uh, make these tough decisions about removing members from their committee. Uh, haven't hesitated to do that. Uh, I think uh, you know that's a, that's a function that goes with those jobs. I do worry a lot about the precedent of another party choosing to do it. This is early in the session. There are genuine questions to be raised here. And in my view, we ought to follow a process that will allow us in a deliberative way to establish the facts and discuss the implications and move from there. So I don't want you to take my statement as suggesting uh, that uh, I don't think action is appropriate. I just think the appropriate action is for the Ethics Commission to look at this, and that's how we should proceed. Uh, so with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Um, I thank the gentleman for his comments. And let me just say for the record that um, uh, when Steve King was denied his committee assignments, um, the Ethics Committee uh, had no role in it. Um, the leadership, the Republican leadership, I decided that that was the right thing to do. It took them a while to get to the right uh, decision, but that was their that they, they took action, and I I think we all appreciate that. When William well, Je when uh, when uh, Congressman um, Jefferson was removed, again there was uh, it wasn't because of an ethics committee uh, recommendation. It was because the Democratic leadership said that he should be stripped of his committees. Uh, so I mean, and the other thing is. Um, you know, this could have been brought to the floor under a privilege resolution, uh, and there would be no opportunity here for uh, for a discussion beforehand. But let me let me just also make the point um, uh, that um, this is not the the issue is, you know, the, the issue is what she has said, and yet uh, some of the things have been before she was sworn in as a member of Congress. But but here's the thing: I mean, she's doubled down on it. She's fundraising off of this stuff as we speak. She tweeted, I won't back down and I will never apologize for all these all these things. And look, in terms of precedent, you know, if the, if the precedent is going to be that if somebody advocates putting a bullet in the head of a member of Congress, uh, and if that is going to be uh, the new determination as to what it takes to throw people off of committees, I'm fine with that. I'm fine with that. And I know the gentleman um, in his statement is not uh, condoning what she has said, and because I have great respect for the gentleman from Oklahoma. He's a he's an incredible member of this institution. But as I said, if this is not the bottom, I don't know what the hell is. Uh, and so I appreciate it. And I want to welcome our two uh, distinguished uh, panelists uh, for the first panel. 
First Chairman uh, Deutsch and Ranking Member Walorski, um, we are happy that you are here. Without objection, any written materials you submit to rules documents at mail.house.gov before the conclusion of this hearing will be entered into the record. Uh, I now recognize the distinguished gentleman from uh, Florida, Mr. Deutsch. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, and thanks to the ranking member, um, ranking member Rolarski, distinguished members of uh, of this committee. I'm sorry that we're here today. I think it's fitting to start there because it is the refusal to apologize the refusal to show basic human decency and the refusal to uphold the reputation of this house that brings us together this afternoon. We're also here today because Republican leadership rewarded that behavior with seats on two House committees. House Resolution 72 seeks to remove Representative Green of Georgia from her positions on the Committee on the Budget and the Committee on Education and Labor. I thank Representative Washington Schultz for her leadership on this important resolution. The resolution was referred to the Committee on Ethics, but I am appearing before you today not only as a chair of that committee, but also as the representative of Parkland, Florida. Prior to her election, Representative Green engaged in a long pattern of threatening and dangerous conduct against the survivors of the shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School almost three years ago to the day, February 14th, 2018. She called mass shootings in Parkland, in Las Vegas, and in Newtown, staged false flag events. She called survivors crisis actors. It is important for this committee to remember why Ms. Green's conduct is so harmful and so very, very dangerous. Ms. Green peddles conspiracy theories that radicalize people online. These theories aren't just diluted, they also advocate violence. They promote harassment, they dehumanize and devalue large swaths of our population based on race and on faith. Last year, FBI Director Ray testified that conspiracy theories like the ones Ms. Green promotes are among the most serious threats to American security. Ms. Green is now a member of Congress, one who has publicly spouted, publicly spouted racist, anti-Semitic, Islamophobic garbage, has harassed survivors of mass shootings, denied their very occurrence. Now, I have I have cried with the families of Parkland and I've grieved with them. And, and in my wallet, I still, to this day, carry a sheet of paper with the names of their loved ones so that they're never forgotten in Congress. So, and Mr. Chairman, as we have this conversation, you're right, you've met You've met families. We've all met the families. I just want to be clear. I'm here today in part because Alyssa Oladef and Scott Beagle and Martin Duque and Nick Dorette and Aaron Feist and Jamie Guttenberg and Chris Hickson and Luke Hoyer and Carl Lofgren and Gina Montalto and Joaquin Oliver and Elena Petty and Meadow Pollock and Helena Ramsey and Alex Schachter and Carmen Chentrop and Peter Wang can not be. The families are still grieving as are the community of Sandy Hook and Las Vegas, and too many more to name. There are not words in the English language to properly describe how the remarks of Ms. Green makes these communities feel. They are still suffering, they will suffer forever, and this makes it so much worse. Ms. Green has not accepted responsibility for her actions, spreading these dangerous lies. If anything, she seems to be emboldened and has promised that she'll never apologize. She's not apologized for amplifying a call for that summary execution of the Speaker of the House. When promoting a rally in Washington, D.C., she called for a takeover of the Capitol with violence if necessary. She said that Congress is nothing and they should fear us. They should be cowering in fear. She told her followers to flood the Capitol, flood all of the government buildings, go inside. These are public buildings. We own them. 
Now look at where we are one month removed from a deadly insurrection. What have Republican leaders said in response to these comments as Ms. Green joined their ranks? Not enough. Finally this week, the Senate leader, Leader McConnell, decried Ms. Green's uh, what he referred to as loony lies and conspiracy theories. And he described her as a cancer for the Republican Party and the country. But in the House, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Ranking Member, Ms. Green was rewarded with seats on both the Education and Labor Committee and the Budget Committee. The Republican leadership isn't holding her accountable for her abhorrent statements and, and incitement. They're sending a signal that they will tolerate this conduct. That's why we're here today, because Minority Leader McCarthy refuses to do the right thing and remove Ms. Green from these committee assignments that give her a platform. House Resolution 72 is an unfortunate, unfortunate, but utterly necessary measure. One of our basic, our most basic individual obligations is to uphold the public's trust in democratic institutions, including this very body where we work. It would be impossible to maintain civic confidence in the integrity of the House if we were to normalize Ms. Green's behavior. We must affirm that this type of behavior is not now, will not be tomorrow, and will never be tolerated in the United States Congress. That is why I support House Resolution 72. And I yield back. Thank you very much. I'm now happy to uh, yield the floor to my friend from uh, Indiana, uh, the ranking member of the Ethics Committee, Ms. Wolorski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ranking, thank you, Chairman McGovern, Ranking Member Cole, and members of the Rules Committee. I appear before the committee today as the ranking member of the House Ethics Committee, a position I was appointed to just two weeks ago. In fact, this is the first time Chairman Deutsch and I have even seen each other, even virtually, since my appointment. This is my second term serving on the Ethics Committee, and I was looking forward to working with Chairman Deutsch in a collegial and bipartisan manner. But here we are, managing a contentious politically driven resolution that was assigned to our committee and will now be on the House floor without proper consideration by the Ethics Committee. What are we doing, Mr. Chairman, Chairman Deutsch? First, let me say that many Republicans have denounced statements made by Representative Green before she became a member of Congress, and I do the same as I appear in front of you today. Republican House leadership said months ago that Representative Green's comments are appalling and he had no tolerance from then, neither do I, and I have a statement on the record as well. I associate myself with my leadership statements, and I know many of my colleagues have and do as well. I am not here to defend Representative Green. I'm here to defend the process of the House, and within this House, the integrity of the Ethics Committee and the functions of the majority and minority parties. The Committee on Ethics is unique. The committee rules, in fact, recognize the importance of the unique way this committee functions. I would like to read directly from the committee rule book. From the foreword on page one. The Committee on Ethics is unique in the House of Representatives, consistent with the duty to carry out its advisory and enforcement responsibilities in an impartial manner. The committee is the only standing committee of the House of Representatives, the membership of which is divided evenly by party. These rules are intended to provide a fair, a fair procedural framework for the conduct of the committee's activities to help ensure that the committee serves well the people of the United States, the House of Representatives, and the members, officers, and employees of the House of Representatives. The committee works best in a collegial and bipartisan manner. In fact, during the 113th, 114th, 115th, and 116th Congresses, all votes taken in the investigative subcommittees were unanimous. The Republicans and Democrats serving on these subcommittees were in agreement. All of the work of the committee, completed by its sitting members, the members who are asked to serve in the investigative subcommittees, and the committee's professional and nonpartisan staff all of the work is accomplished by bipartisan cooperation. And the work of the Ethics Committee is extensive. 
In the 116th Congress alone, the committee commenced or continued investigative fact gatherings regarding 50 separate investigative matters, impaneled six investigative subcommittees, held 32 investigative subcommittee meetings, filed five reports with the House totaling over 3,300 pages regarding various investigative matters, publicly addressing 16 matters, resolved 24 additional matters, conducted 110 voluntary witness interviews, and reviewed over 420,000 pages of documents. And you can see why I was excited to serve with you, Chairman Deutsch. Each of these tasks was agreed to by the chair and the ranking member of the committee. The committee operates effectively because it's a consensus driven committee with decisions made jointly by the chair and the ranking member. But as to Representative Green, the current chair and ranking member have not received a complaint and determined whether the information meets the requirements of the committee rules. The chair and the ranking member have not jointly gathered information concerning this alleged conduct. The chair and the ranking member have not had a single conversation regarding Representative Green. This committee has not even had its first organizing meeting for the 117th Congress. But yet the chair seeks to bring this matter before the House without proper committee consideration and jurisdiction and without due process. I believe it's worth noting that the majority did not have to refer this resolution to the Ethics Committee. The majority could have brought this matter directly to the floor through a privileged question, but instead it chose to violate the one thing that's working in this place the collegial bipartisan manner by which the Ethics Committee could operate and has always operated with massive, major accomplishments and success. The Committee on Ethics has not exercised its, jur its jurisdiction over statements made by a member of Congress that were not otherwise unlawful before they were sworn into office. The Ethics Committee has sole jurisdiction over the interpretation of the Code of Official Conduct, which governs members of Congress, officers, and employees. But the statements that I have seen publicly were made before Ms. Green was a candidate or before she was sworn in as a member of Congress on January 3rd. Most, if not all, of the statements were made in 2018 and 2019 when Ms. Green was a regular citizen of the United States. The timing of the statements does not make them right, but the timing of the statements does put them outside the Ethics Committee's jurisdiction. The nonpartisan professional staff of the committee has provided, and the chair is aware that I intended to share this opinion today, that quote, a review of public committee reports will indicate that the committee has not asserted jurisdiction over matters occurring prior to service in Congress where the conduct was unrelated to a campaign for the House and or occupied or occurred prior to an individual's candidacy for the House. And also quote, committee staff is not aware of any instance in which the committee has disciplined a member for or initiate an investigation into conduct that occurred prior to a member's qualification as a candidate for election to the House or was unrelated to the member's successful campaign to the House. Nor is committee staff aware of any instance in which the committee has disciplined a member or initiated an investigation solely into statements that a member made prior to swearing in that are not otherwise unlawful. If the Ethics Committee is to review its jurisdiction over statements made by members of Congress on both sides of the aisle before they're sworn in, then the matter could come before the committee in a way that complies with committee rules and preserves the bipartisan collegiality intended. It should not come to the Ethics Committee in this unprecedented manner. It's not the function of the majority party to make this determination unilaterally. It is unprecedented for the majority party to take action to remove a minority member from his or her committee assignments for any reason. Again, let me be clear. I'm not here defending Representative Green. I'm here to defend a process with phenomenal members on both sides, led by incredible chairmen, has worked for decades in this institution. And if there was ever a time to pull this country together and to handle something and model something that works. Here we are. I'm here to defend these processes. 
the functions of the majority and minority parties. House Resolution 72 is unprecedented. I agree with Ranking Member Cole's statement that history has shown respect for the right of each side of the aisle to assign their own members to the committees they chose and to hold their members accountable for their behavior. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your time today. I yield back. Um, I thank the gentlewoman for her, her testimony. Um, and let me, let me again uh, say for the record that um, it has not been the practice, nor is it expected, nor is it in the rules that to remove somebody from a committee should be going through the ethics committee. I mean, I mean, Steve King, who you, the Republicans belatedly removed because of his statements on embracing white supremacist uh, ideas, did not go through the ethics committee. It's not a recommendation of the ethics committee. I gave you another example of, of, of Congressman Jefferson. Uh, that was his removal from the committee was not as a result of the ethics committee. So we have that, that's, that's the precedent, okay? Um, we're here today because to be honest with you, uh, the Republican leadership hasn't dealt with this and it's unclear whether they're able to deal with it based on internal political strife. But let me ask uh, Mr. Deutsch and Ms. Woleski a question here. Um, is the ethics committee constituted? I mean, uh, do we have all the Democratic members and the Republican members? Are they, are they, do we, we even have an ethics committee ready to go? No, <clears throat> Ms. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, first of all, uh, the answer to that is no. We don't have a full complement of members because the um, Republican members have not all been named, so we've not yet been constituted. Um, it's hard to argue. I just want to, if I could, since since a lot of this was addressed to me, Mr. Chairman, I'd just like to clarify a few things. Um, it, it, it's hard to argue that this should that the committee doesn't have jurisdiction, but this should nevertheless go before the committee, but. We can talk, and I want to clear a few things up, but then I want to talk just for a second about really the heart of the matter. Article 1, Section 5 of the Constitution vests the House with independent authority, independent of the House Ethics Committee, to discipline any of its members for disorderly behavior for which the appropriate sanction may include the limitation of any right, power, privilege, or immunity of that member. There is no doubt, based on the language of the Constitution, that the House is well within its right to impose this sanction. But I want to... I, I want to just be clear, we wouldn't be here in this position today, and that's where I started. I'm sorry that we're here. I'm sorry, Ranking Member Wolarski, that this is the first occasion that we've had to be together in a formal way like this, but we wouldn't be here if Representative Green had not been seemingly, and it is all, and, and I, I appreciate your and, and the Ranking Member's words about how awful these statements are and these actions are. But we wouldn't be here if Republican leadership hadn't rewarded Representative Green with seats on the Budget Committee, the Education and Labor Committee, despite her behavior, despite uh, her actions. We wouldn't be here if Leader McCarthy had been responsive to what I am quite confident uh, in describing as the nation's collective outrage at Representative Green's behavior. Um, I, I wonder if I can, Mr. Chairman, just submit for the the record, a letter from uh, Sandy Hook Promise from Mark Barden and uh, and Nicole Hockley. Mark Barden was uh, is Daniel's father. Daniel was killed at Sandy Hook. Nicole Hockley, Dylan's mom, and they say in their letter, uh, "We have dedicated our lives since the murder of our sons to stopping school shootings and preventing more families from feeling the devastating loss we must endure every day." Representative Green has fueled conspiracy theories and supporters. The claim that the Sandy Hook shooting and other violent murders of children never happened. These vicious lies deny the deaths of our murdered children and bring death threats and constant harassment to our doors and our surviving children. Mr. Ch Mr. Chairman, this is this is not. We can't hide behind process arguments, which on their uh, on the merits aren't d accurate anyway. This is about language and action that attacks the memory of those who have been killed in, in, by gun violence. It is anti-Semitic, it is racist, it is Islamophobic. And to say that we should just simply spend time thinking about whether everything that we know that's been said is offensive enough to, to warrant action uh, is, is just, it's not a, a, 
creditable approach to this whole issue. Let me just say one last thing on this, because you talked about the, at the Ethics Committee. The role of the Ethics Committee, Mr. Chairman, and I take this as seriously as any member of the House, and I know that Ranking Member Wolarski does as well. The role of the Ethics Committee is to uphold the integrity of the House. When this new member, after this whole litany of words and actions and threats, was rewarded with membership on these two committees, that has done damage to the integrity of the House. The Constitution gives us the right to take this action. It is appropriate for us to take this action. And sadly, um, it is necessary for us to take this action because no other action to respond to this has been taken by the leadership. Ms. Wolorski, you wanted to respond. Yeah, you go ahead. Yeah, you have to unmute. Unmute. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to finish up the response to you. Um, just to remind you, there were other ways to get this to the floor. It's the majority that, that decided to assign this to ethics, then bypass the, bypass the committee and bring it to the floor. You guys could have brought it as a privileged question. You could have brought it right to the floor. I'm not arguing. I'm not sitting here arguing about um, the merits of the case and, and what you're seeking to do. Yeah. I just simply want to say about an institution that's been working, because you guys chose this way, assigning it to the ethics committee and then bypassing it yeah. and, and bringing it right down, we're going to destroy what kind of integrity the chairman's been talking about and even member to member trust politically. Yeah. <laughs> this could be a power grab perceived by American people. I think it's a power grab, consolidation of power. That's why I'm concerned because you chose to do it this way. You had other options. But, and, and I have nothing but the highest respect for my friend from Indiana who we work together on a lot of issues. But I, I, I have to tell you, I'm a little baffled by your argument just now because what you're basically saying is that, yeah, we could have gone a different way and had less of a process. If we had gone the route of the uh, privilege resolution, uh, you would not have this opportunity to present uh, your uh, your points of view uh, like you're doing right now. So I don't. I, I'm a little bit uh, um, baffled by that. You had asked earlier, you know, what we what what are we doing today, and uh, and you know, and what we're doing and why we're here today. Um, we're here today because of what uh, the the gentleman from Georgia has said. What she has posted. I mean, it is clear. I mean, it's it's on her social media. I mean, uh, Holocaust deniers that she has um, given them oxygen. I mean, it's 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 really beyond the pale. The gentleman from Florida talked about uh, the, you know, the 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 the, the outrageous claims regarding the shootings in in Parkland and in uh, and in Sandy Hook. But let me remind you again of her statements endorsing violence, uh, at the assassination of our of our colleagues, and so look, um, we're doing our job here because part of what we're doing here is we're upholding the integrity and the decency of this institution. And you know, you had asked, like, this is a political process. I'm I'm trying to figure that out because. You know, um, the gentleman from Oklahoma said he condemns the statements. Uh, you said that you don't want to be affiliated with, with those statements. We're, we, I've said it, Mr. Deutsch has said it, you're going to hear others say it. So we're all at least here in agreement that um, that this that this is beyond the pale. So I don't understand, you know, the only reason why we're here is because my friends have decided not to do anything. And I guess you could say, you know, well, let's let's check it, you know, let's put it in the in the um, uh, you know in the ethics committee, which it hasn't been constituted yet, which Republicans haven't appointed their members yet. We can kick the can down the road, and maybe in a few weeks or maybe a few months, everybody will forget about it. But here's here's the thing, and I'll just and I'll end with this, and I'll yield to Mr. Cole. But you know, what I worry about is what does it say? If we do nothing, what does it say if we just, you know, put our hands up in the air and say, well, you know, this is just, you know, outrageous statements and we, we just we should move on to do something else. I'll tell you, 
what an awful message to send to this country uh, during this very difficult time. And we just all lived through a terrible episode on January 6th when violence occurred in this chamber. And to have people in our midst advocating for violence, ad advocating for assassinations, and to, and to not respond to that. And I think what we're doing here, quite frankly, is the minimum we should be doing. I personally think she should resign. I, think, I, I don't think she's fit to serve in this institution, but this is the minimum. Like I said, at the end of my opening statement, I would like to think we could have a bipartisan vote on this. Because I think if we did, boy, that, that talk about bringing the country together, that would send a message. Uh, anyway, I, I appreciate um, uh, both of the witnesses here. I'm, I'm happy to now yield to my good friend from Oklahoma, Mr. Cole. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just some housekeeping business first, if I may. I asked unanimous uh, consent uh, for to submit for the record a statement uh, from Mr. Biggs of Arizona in support of Mr. Babin's amendment to H. Resolution 72. Uh, without objection. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Just a, a quick couple of points. Um, and let me ask you, Ms. Wolorski, and, and then certainly would uh, ask you as well, Mr. Chairman. But um, when this was referred to the Ethics Committee, did you expect the Ethics Committee would actually take it up? Never. And why is that? My understanding of being a member of the Ethics Committee is this is outside of our jurisdiction. And I guess when somebody says we're going to refer this to the Ethics Committee, then it's kind of like, okay, well, there, you know, we have to have a complaint. We have to go through the process that I just went through here. We have an investigation. The chairman and I talk about it and, you know, make a decision as the chairman and the ranking member. Um, none of that had happened. Can the gentleman just spend for one second? Can everybody who's not speaking make sure they press their mute button so we can hear Ms. Wolorski clearly? Thank you. Uh, certainly, Mr. Chairman, I'd, I'd uh, give you a chance to make the, to respond to that. But uh, sure, uh, thanks, thanks, Mr. Cole. Uh, if if there, if, I'm just I'm I'm really at a loss because if the argument is that this never would come before the ethics committee. And yet, the, at the same time, the argument is that this should have gone to the Ethics Committee. Then you're creating this loop, which means only one thing, that there would never be accountability. Never be accountability. And just if I may, just Mr. Ranky member, in April of 2018, a Facebook commenter asked our colleague, now do we get to hang them? meaning H and O referring to Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton, to which she responded, stage is being set, players are being put in place, we must be patient, this must be done perfectly or liberal judges will let them off. And then she created a petition to impeach Speaker Pelosi and said, it's a crime punishable by death is what treason is. Nancy Pelosi is guilty of treason. Uh, Mr. Cole, I could go on and on, but if the argument is that we need to have a process but then the conclusion is that that process would provide no accountability. That is exactly why we're here. That is why well, we must be that's, here. That's not, with all due respect, that's not an argument I've made. Uh, I think uh, I think process is important, but uh, you know we'll uh, reserve and see what happens on that. Uh, last uh, last point: uh, we're not recommending doing nothing. That's not what I suggested. That's not what anybody has suggested. Uh, we do think we're on unusual ground in applying the code of conduct to conduct before somebody was here. That doesn't mean we shouldn't do that, by the way. Uh, that doesn't mean that's not worth thinking about uh, because I do think these remarks are extraordinarily disturbing and they are worthy of being considered. Uh, and uh, all I'm saying is I would like some process to do that and uh, Again, it seemed to me that the Ethics Committee was the appropriate place to do it. Uh, you have an excellent record as a chairman of bringing people together to make difficult decisions. Ms. Walorski has been a member of that committee and has been part of that process. 
That's the point I'm making. I'm not, uh, don't misunderstand what I'm saying to defend the indefensible because I think these comments are indefensible. I just think there's a, a, a different and better way to proceed here. And that's the subject of my remarks. So I know my friend uh, would understand that, but I just wanted to be clear for the record. With that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. Yeah, thank you uh, uh, very much. And again, I, I just, I mean, we can go down these rabbit holes of uh, process, but when we have done this in the past, it has, it has not been as a result of an ethics committee uh, deliberation. Uh, and so uh, at this point, I'd like to yield to uh, the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Torres. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I've had the honor of serving in Congress for six years now. In that time, I have developed wonderful friendships with Democrats and Republicans. For example, every time Rep Representative Virginia Fox testifies before this committee, I try to remind her how much I value our friendship despite our policy differences. It is also beneath me to not apologize when I am wrong. That's because this is the people's house. The American people expect us to work together, to get along and try to address the challenges they face every single day. The American people, our constituents, expect their leaders to be grounded in basic facts and to have a basic level of human decency. And while I hold most of my colleagues in great esteem, sadly, there are exceptions to this expectation. We are here to vote on a resolution to remove Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene from her committee assignments due to conduct that is contrary, contrary to our House rules and the inaction of Republicans. I am confused as to how long should we expect to wait for Republicans to take action on something so deplorable. To quote Senate Mi Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, loony lies and conspiracy theories are a cancer. I would go farther than that. They are dangerous and a threat to our domestic security. Anyone who conducts themselves in such a manner should not be legitimized by holding a platform on committees of national importance. Let me be clear. Anyone who tarnishes the memory of the children, the children who died at Sandy Hook by saying the massacre was staged is not fit to serve on any, any House committee. Anyone who chases a child, chases a child, a survivor of the Parkland shooting for the mean spirited purpose of harassing, intimidating and belittling them, belittling a child by shouting at them in public and calling them cowards while videotaping the exchange does not deserve to craft policy on the committee that determines how to educate and keep our children safe. Think about that. Regrettably, the trauma caused by this mass shooting, a horrific event, led to the unfortunate suicide of two survivors. Colleagues, I am a proud Californian, and I take issue with anyone who disrespects Californian lives lost by promoting hate against our Jewish friends and neighbors, claiming that the wildfires were started by Jewish space lasers. 
does not deserve to serve on a committee that sets our national funding levels. Anyone who questioned the 9-11 attack endorsed executions against our colleagues referred to the midterms as Islamic invasion, simply put, is a danger to this institution and our personal safety. Bigoted conspiracy theories are what incited a mob of domestic terrorists to storm the Capitol. And as a result of the attack, the United States Capitol has changed. Blue lives have been lost. When murdered at the hands of the angry mob, posting, posting this sign on your door is not justice. It's an embarrassment. This building is a historical place, a national treasure where my constituents used to easily visit. Now it requires militarized security. And still, when I walk the halls, I do not feel safe. Words have consequences. We are going through a time of tragedy. More Americans have died from the coronavirus than during World War II. We need to come together. It is time to hold members that so bigoted theories that have caused bloodshed and that are meant to divide us accountable for their words and actions. We must hold members of Congress to a standard that reflects the historical dignity of this body. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Burgess. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, let me just associate myself with the remarks of our, our ranking member, Mr. Cole, the Sage of Oklahoma. Um, I think he said things quite well and quite succinctly. I will say for the record, I don't support the comments that are attributed to our colleague from Georgia. Indeed, in full disclosure, I supported and worked for someone else in that primary. Uh, at the same time, I, like Ms. Walorski, I don't quite understand the referral to the Ethics Committee, but perhaps that will be further explained as, uh, as the hearing goes on. But in the interest of time, I'm going to yield back. Thank you very much. I'm going to uh, go to Mr. Raskin right now. Uh, Mr. Chairman, could I pass for the moment and come back to me? I'm just completing one of the things. Is, is, Mr., is Mr. Perlmutter? No, okay. Let me go to uh, Mr. Uh, Rushenthaler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. I'd like to echo the sentiment of Ranking Member Cole. I would like to just uh, draw attention to the fact that we do need to look at the precedent setting for a statute of limitations. Uh, to my knowledge, when we've done this in the past, it's been for comments that have been made while the member was in office. I just think I'm not advocating one way or the other. I'm just saying that the question needs to be asked, are we going to adopt the statute of limitations? And if we are, how far back that statute of limitation, uh, it goes back. Additionally, that would lead to the question of when does the ethics committee have jurisdiction? So for example, <clears throat> if comments are made in that statute of limitations period, whenever it is, when that person is a candidate, do they then get vetted by the ethics committee? These are just questions I am posing uh, because if we are gonna go down this route, the precedent is set, which would require uh, a, a statute of limitation. With that, I yield back, thank you. I, I thank the gentleman very much. I just wanna again point out that um, uh, the gentlewoman from Georgia has doubled down on her uh, comments. Uh, she's been quite, uh, as, as a member of Congress, as a member of Congress, um, and you can check her Twitter account out uh, to validate that. I'm now yielding to Ms. Scanlon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, uh, listening to our witnesses and the members of this committee, all I can think about is what a terribly sad day this is for our country and for Congress. Uh, but we don't have a choice but to deal with this. Historically, the parties have policed themselves. 
Even as recently as a couple of years ago, our Republican colleagues removed a member from committees after he made a series of false and despicable statements. But that was the old GOP. Now, when a member of the House Republican Caucus advocates for insurrection, violence against elected officials and children, or promotes fringe conspiracy theories, apparently the Republican Party embraces that member and assigns her to committees where her unhinged beliefs can do the most harm. For apparently the party of limited government and fiscal responsibility, free markets and peace through strength has become the party of conspiracy theories in QAnon. And that's not my assessment. That's a direct quote from Republican Senator John Thune of South Dakota. A Republican party that endorses the violence and conspiracy theories espoused by the representative from Georgia is not our parents' Republican party. It's not Ronald Reagan's GOP or the Bush's GOP. And if today's House Republican caucus wants to embrace this behavior, the majority does not. We cannot, because as the bill before us states, this member's behavior does not reflect credibly upon the House. Representative Green's extensive, detailed, and public history of making dangerous and downright outrageous comments cannot go unaddressed. My colleagues on the other side of the aisle know this. And by refusing to hold a member of their own party accountable, they force us to take the unprecedented but necessary action to stop the spread of conspiracy theories, lies, and hate in Congress. Um, you know, Representative Green apparently stands for the Republican Party that likes to own the libs on Twitter and fire up the base with misinformation and outright lies, particularly the big lie promoted by the ex-president that his loss of the presidential election was tied to fraud, a blatantly untrue allegation that when repeated often enough and loudly enough, incited the violent attack on a joint session of Congress in this building one month ago today. But that's how we got here to where we are today. Years of angry, vengeful, alt-right pundits sowing racism, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, and lies about America. So now they've infected the grand old party and now Republican leadership is doing nothing to separate themselves or their constituents from these conspiracy theories that thrive amidst the hatred. No matter how much our colleagues today say that they disapprove of the representative's conduct, they must realize she's now the face of their party. The woman who supported the armed insurrection of the Capitol, which has taken the lives of six people, including three police officers, has more influence on her party than our colleagues here do today. Think about this. If Marjorie Taylor Greene was in any other job, she could not avoid serious disciplinary action with her history of advocating for violence against her colleagues, challenging police officers and refusing to abide by law enforcement rules put in place for the security of everyone who works in this building and advocating for lies which undermine the job we're all entrusted to do here for the American people. So this conduct would not be tolerated in any other workplace in America, and the Capitol should be no different. This isn't canceling the voice of the representative from Georgia. It's about accountability. As one of our colleagues has mentioned, there is no right to committee assignments. But if a member conducts themselves in so disgraceful a way that she brings discredit upon Congress, and her own party is incapable of addressing the problem, then the House as a whole has to do it. And with that, I yield back. Thank you very much, Ms. Fishback. And, and Mr. Chair, I appreciate the opportunity. And, you know, as one of the freshman members and new to Congress, you know, it really does seem to me that this would be setting a new precedent. And, and one that I think could be very dangerous. It's a precedent where the majority party can punish a member of the minority party by removing them from their committee assignments. And, and I really don't believe that this precedent is in the best interest of the body. And, um, but I appreciate the opportunity to take just a minute. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Mr. Perlmutter, are you ready? Or Mr. Raskin, who's? Um, yes, I'm delighted to, to okay. go, Mr. Chair. Mr. Okay. Um, with your permission, Mr. Chairman, um, yeah, I just want to speak in very strong favor of this resolution. I was hoping uh, when I first saw it that this would be an opportunity for real bipartisanship uh, on the part of 
the Rules Committee, um, and uh, we love our colleagues on both sides of uh, the aisle in the committee, and I thought that we could model for the whole House um, our determination to stand against um, this kind of uh, militant and deranged extremism, which has become such a threat to American democracy. Um, I was delighted to see the remarks by uh, the Senate Republican leader, Mr. McConnell, who said, and I'm going to quote, loony lies and conspiracy theories are cancer for the Republican Party and our country. Somebody who suggested that perhaps no airplane hit the Pentagon on 9-11, that horrifying school shootings were pre-staged, and that the Clintons crashed John F. Kennedy Jr.'s airplane is not living in reality. This has nothing to do with the challenges facing American families or the robust debates on substance that can strengthen our party. I've been reading um, Sid Blumenthal's wonderful multi-volume biography of Abraham Lincoln, which I recommend to my colleagues because it's about Lincoln as a politician and how he always tried to put moral criteria at the center of political controversy. So he would be anchored in a moral analysis. And when he founded the, the GOP, it wasn't called the GOP then, but when he founded the Republican Party, he was taking on the know-nothings, and he hated their racism, and he hated their conspiracy theories, and he hated their anti-immigrant feeling, which was directed then at the Irish and at the Germans. That was the foundation of the Republican Party, one of our great Republican parties. And uh, I would uh, take no delight in seeing the Republican Party destroyed, but it is being destroyed by these fanatical conspiracy theories and by the racism and by the anti-Semitism that has been unleashed by this kind of thinking. And so, um, you know, if, the, if our friends in the Republican Party won't take a strong stand against it, then we in the House of Representatives must take a strong stand against it. And I favor this resolution and I yield back to you, Mr. Chairman. Hey, thank you very much. And, and let me let me just say again, as I said at the beginning, I hope that uh, when this comes to a vote, that it's a bipartisan vote, uh, because I think that would be a strong unifying message to this country. And you know, I've heard a lot about precedent. I mean, the, the new precedent here is that a member of this house uh, is calling for assassinations. That's the that's the new precedent. And as I said, you know, uh, if that's the standard that we uh, we move people from committees, I'm fine with that. I'm fine with that. Um, Mr. Perlmutter. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. I came in uh, late. I did hear Ms. Fishbach and, and some of Ms. Uh, Wilarski's comments. I, this gives me no pleasure, and I, I agree with Ms. Fishbach. This is the precedent. I don't like this precedent. But as the chairman has said, uh, the language uh, Ms. Green has used, uh, the, the universe that she has lives in, denying the school shootings and lasers from outer space, starting the fires. Um, I, I don't think we have any alternative. I, I certainly had wished that Mr. McCarthy and the caucus, the uh, Republican caucus, would have uh, taken stronger steps than they have, and uh, I don't think we have any other choice. And I, uh, I appreciate the comments of the witnesses and uh, the other members and concerns shared by Mr. Cole and Ms. Fishbach, but uh, this thing uh, goes beyond the pale and it does discredit to the uh, House of Representatives if we don't do something. So with that, I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Morelli. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, apologize. I got kicked off, so I may, I'm certainly probably going to repeat what other members have said. Um, I, you know, I, I think uh, uh, the distinguished ranking member said there must be a different and better way. And I actually don't disagree. I think there was and there is a different and better way. The different and better way would be for the minority leader to exercise the leadership that he is entrusted with to make certain that members of his caucus serve in appropriate 
positions and the decision that he made and the steering and policy members in the Republican caucus made was to put Marjorie Taylor Greene on the Educational Labor Committee. And to the point others have made, you did that with full knowledge of all the things that she has said leading up to her time in Congress and since her time in Congress. You had that as material that, that went into the decision you made on which committees uh, this individual would serve on. And so was there a different and better way? Absolutely. Um, and in the ensuing days since it's been highlighted more and more of what this member's um, conduct has been, there have been ample opportunities during the ensuing days to make good on this, do the right thing. What's the old saw? There's never a, uh, uh, it, 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 there's always, <laughs> that's all you asked for it and I can't even repeat it. Never um, a bad time to do the right thing, I think is, is the way it says. So over the last several days, you could have done the right thing. You could have stepped up. And I think the minority leader has to take on the responsibility for what I think is a tragic, misguided decision. Could undo it. You could undo it today. You could undo it before the House acts. So this is a, um, a simple one. And, and frankly, this really is a question of right and wrong. I wasn't uh, at the Pentagon on 9-11. I was in New York City. I watched those buildings burn and come down uh, where thousands of Americans lost their lives. And Ms. Taylor Green has indicated that she questions whether or not anyone actually saw the plane hit the Pentagon. I wasn't there. I'll assume that the thousands of witnesses and people in the building uh, speak for it. But, you know, as others have said, you, you could continue to, to talk about this. The other thing that I find striking about this um, is it would be one thing if having said or done some of these things in the past, the member demonstrated some remorse that, and I understand from press reports, there have been numerous attempts by colleagues, probably on both sides, but certainly on the Republican side, to have her come out and say publicly, I apologize. They were intemperate remarks, they were ill-informed, whatever it is you wanna say, but she has, not only double down, triple down, quadruple down, she has boasted of raising $1.6 million off of her comments in the last several days as though this is some kind of joke or this is some kind of way to raise campaign funds. I mean, how cynical have we gotten? How just completely lacking in any morals would someone suggest that all of their comments to date should not only not be apologized for, but should be used as an effort to raise campaign dollars. I, I find it hard to imagine. Yes, these are unprecedented actions we may be taking. These are certainly unprecedented times, and she is certainly an unprecedented type of member. And in fact, I think has said publicly in tweets that if we do this, the Republican majority in two years will use this extensively to hurt Democratic members. I'm paraphrasing, but. Essentially, that's it. And apparently now she speaks for the entire Republican caucus, not just for herself, but she's now going to say what they will do to us. Um, I find this all incredibly, incredibly disturbing. And I am someone, I came out of an institution and now I am part of another institution that values very much its history, its precedence, that values decorum, that values people having respect for one another, even when they disagree. But there's no room for that um, with this member, as far as I can tell. And to continue to double down, to continue to suggest that not only does she not um, regret her comments, but every indication that going forward, she continues to, and I'm sure probably will, use the same type of language, continue to engage in conspiracy theories. Um, and I must say, Probably the person that sold me most on voting yes today is probably Mitch McConnell. Because frankly, I don't know that I would say Senator McConnell has been um, a beacon uh, over the last several years. Um, for him to have reached a point to make the comments that he has made, I think says volumes about where we are and the actions we take. So do I wish um, to my good friend there was a, a, a different and better way? There have been. You chose not to take advantage of them. You should have, and I think everyone should be embarrassed by the comments that um, this member has made in the past and has continued to make. 
And so uh, with that, Mr. Chair, I'll yield back and I will Thank you. strongly support this rule and I will strongly support the resolution on the Thank floor. Thank you, Mr. Desanye. Yeah, you have to unmute. Yeah. Okay, wait, okay. We, I can't, uh, we can't hear you for some reason. Um, we'll, we'll come back to you. We'll go to Ms. Ross and then we'll come back to you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, I think it's unfortunate that we are in this position today. I think it's unfortunate that the rules committee is having to deal with this though. Um, I do appreciate the chairman pointing out on multiple occasions that um, this at least gives an opportunity for a committee hearing um, when there doesn't appear to be another appropriate committee for this. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at this um, as precedent over um, only a one month period of time. So I think many people, particularly those in, um, in the Republican party have known about um, Ms. Green's remarks. They knew about it because of her primary. But the question is, um, as a member, what has she done since she's come here in light of those remarks and in light of the insurrection that we had and how has the Republican conference responded to that? And we all know, and these are just facts, that um, committee appointments were made much later um, by the Republican conference. And that's one reason why this committee has had so much action over the last couple of weeks. And those appointments were made after the insurrection with full knowledge of um, Congresswoman Green's previous comments, with full knowledge of how she's comported herself here, with full knowledge of her involvement in the insurrection. And despite all that knowledge, as Mr. Morelli has put, put forward and done so really very convincingly, she was appointed to the Education and Labor Committee with all of that knowledge. That is a dereliction of duty. That is ignoring the facts and the implications and in fact, that is giving her yet another platform to not just hurt people with her words, but encourage other people to hurt people with their actions. And I think um, Congressman Deutsch's testimony was so powerful about the families of children who are being further terrorized, but the conference gave her that platform. That was an error. Then Minority Leader McCarthy was given another opportunity to say, you know, maybe that wasn't such a good idea. Even with members of his own party saying, you know, we just don't want to deal with this. <clears throat> this is inappropriate and it is wrong. But no, he did not take the opportunity to do the right thing. And that leaves us. It leaves us on this rules committee and it leaves us in Congress to have to do what we shouldn't have to do. It should be up to the Republican Congress co conference to police its members, to do the right thing. And if you do not agree with the way somebody is inciting violence and, and putting forth blatantly false information, why, why would you give them a further platform? We have an obligation to do this for the good of the country and for the good of this Congress. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll try Mr. Desanye, see whether we get him this time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Like a sense around. Okay. Good. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, let me just briefly say, uh, I'd like to associate myself with the comments of my friend from Florida, the chairman of the ethics committee, Mr. Deutsch, uh, as a member of the education committee and uh, just how implausible and, and remarkable 
the thought of having someone who's used this language be on that committee. Um, and then secondarily, just if ever there were a time that we, we would be aware of the importance of words and their impact, um, seems like it's a short memory, it wasn't very long ago. So words matter, words matter for uh, any elected official. And I'm reminded of um, the, the period when Oliver Wendell Holmes and Justice Brandeis were debating uh, First Amendment or free speech, First Amendment rights, uh, when they said that you don't have a right to stand up in the middle of a crowded theater and scream fire. Uh, so too is the case here. You don't have a right as a member of Congress to use, to weaponize this kind of language. Uh, we've seen the clear and present danger when people do this and in an era of social media and unfortunately too many elected officials thinking attention is what they're here for. Um, we have to at least, as the chairman said, take this action. Uh, and as others have said, I'm not, I'm not the least bit happy that we have to be here, but I'm also uh, not the least bit um, doubting in the validity of the actions that are proposed here today. And I would urge my colleagues to vote uh, for this resolution. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, I think everybody's asked questions, but I wanna give Ms. Belowski and Mr. Deutsch the final word because you're, You've heard a lot here, so I want to make sure if there's anything that uh, anybody missed or any last points you want to make. Uh, if you um, give you the up, I know you have to go to another meeting, but why don't you, you can go, Ms. Belowski, I'll begin with you, then I with Mr. Deutsch. Thanks again, Mr. Chairman. I just want to uh, you know, tell all of my colleagues are on this call, and I thank them for being on this call. I just want to reemphasize that I really believe that taking this step it does weaponize the Ethics Committee. And I think it's a tragedy that that's exactly what's going to happen. You know, there's comments from a lot of members. Um, you know, we've made decisions in the ethics committee before that we're not looking prior to folks being in Congress. And I think that we're um, walking down this unprecedented path. And I just want to say it with, with a warning and with a disappointment that we have a phenomenal committee that's really modeled what committees should be when it comes to being bipartisan and working each other, working these things out in the committee process. And I think that we are weaponizing a committee that will regret. And I think it's, um, I think it's sad and I, I just think it's wrong, but I, I am grateful for the opportunity, Mr. Chairman, to be here as a witness. And thank you to all my colleagues for your opinions as well. And I yield back. Uh, Mr. Deutsch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I first wanna just also submit for the record uh, a letter from, Stand with Parkland, the National Association of Families for Safe Schools, founded by the families of the victims in the Parkland High School massacre, who wrote respectfully requesting that, uh, wrote to uh, uh, Leader McCarthy respectfully requesting that Representative Green be removed from the Education and Labor Committee. Uh, I wanted Mr. Chairman just to quickly uh, make clear once again, it's been a long hearing, but the Constitution clearly provides the, with the House, vests with the House, the independent authority independent, independent of the Ethics Committee to discipline any of its members where the appropriate sanction may include the limitation of any right, power, privilege, or immunity of that member. We are well within our rights to do this. I would like to talk just, I would like to again uh, address the issue of precedent. I, Mr. Chairman, you said this eloquently and I, I just couldn't agree more. Um, the precedent that we should be concerned with is the precedent of, uh, the precedent of not allowing members who traffic and anti-Semitism and racism and Islamophobia and violent threats against public officials to have the benefit of sitting on a committee in the House of Representatives. The precedent that members of Congress cannot trade in conspiracy theories without consequences and the precedent that members should not and cannot attack and harass private citizens, let alone survivors of gun violence without consequences. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we've not had a chance to, to uh, talk about, uh, but I would just, refer back to uh, just last Congress when the House passed almost unanimously a resolution uh, that condemned QAnon and the conspiracy theories that it promotes. That resolution conveyed the sense of the House of Representatives of which we are all a part, that conspiracy theories like those promoted by QAnon encourage the rejection of objective reality, 
deepen our nation's political polarization and undermine trust in America's democratic institutions. We cannot afford to allow that trust to be undermined anymore. Uh, I, I, am, I, I say this, we talk about our colleagues. Um, I do view Ranking Member Walarski as a friend. I am sorry that this is the first opportunity that we have to work together in this capacity. And I, and I mean this not as an attack against her, but merely as a defense of the people that I represent and so many around the country. When I tell you that I know for a fact with absolute certitude that when we use a word like tragedy to talk about the decision to simply make sure that there is accountability here, that for the families in Parkland and the families in Sandy Hook and the families in Las Vegas who know that this is a person who has questioned whether these mass shootings even existed, um, they know what tragedy is. They've experienced tragedy. They live it every single day. We have to act today, Mr. Chairman. I hope we do it in a bipartisan way today. And again, on Thursday, my colleagues all seem in agreement that what's been said is, unaccept is unacceptable. So then we need to take this action because it is the only opportunity that we have to do so. I really appreciate the opportunity to be with you. And I thank the committee for being so thoughtful and deliberative throughout this entire process. Well, I, th I thank you both um, for uh, for being here. Um, let me just wait, does any other committee wish to ask a question? Seeing none, let me just close by saying, I wanna thank you both for being here. I have enormous <clears throat> for both of you. Um, but I think what's frustrating to me about this hearing Mr. Deutsch just referenced it, is that some of my friends on the Republican side uh, began by saying we are in agreement that we're appalled by these statements. And then it's followed by a but, uh, but the process, but the pro. Well, first of all, as we've said over and over and over again, uh, the history of removing people from committees doesn't go by way of the ethics committee, number one. Number two, we're not weaponizing the Ethics Committee. The Ethics Committee is not even constituted. The Republicans haven't even put their members on the Ethics Committee. Uh, uh, but I would just say this. I really hope that uh, the, the leadership on the Republican side gives members the freedom to vote their conscience on this. Because uh, this is not about process. This is about who we are. This is about this institution. This is about decency. I mean, we we are dealing with somebody who has said things that go beyond the pale. I mean, talking about assassinating members of Congress, among other things. So this is a whole different place we're in. And to be just very candid here, uh, this is not a surprise. Leader McCarthy has been told that this would be coming unless he acted. Um, it's February 3rd. Uh, we've waited long enough. And, um, and I think we are proceeding in a way that, quite frankly, affords more of a process than if this were brought to the floor under a privileged resolution. So I, again, we all regret we are in this moment, um, but you know, here we are. And I think the question is, are we gonna do anything or not? And I hope that in a bipartisan way, the answer is yes. So I thank you both and uh, you, you are now excused. Um, I want to uh, welcome our next witness, the gentlewoman from Florida, Representative Washington Schultz, who is the author of this um, uh, legislation. I want to thank her for providing testimony today. Any written material is you submit to documents at mail.house.gov before the conclusion of this hearing will, without objection, be entered into the record. I now recognize the gentlewoman from Florida, Ms. Wasserman Schultz. Thank you, Chairman McGovern, Ranking Member Cole, and members of the Rules Committee. I truly wish I was not sitting here today to present my resolution to remove Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene from her committee assignments. But I've listened to all of the testimony and the members' comments throughout the, the, the breadth of this hearing. And I have enough experience as a legislator to know that when you don't have a leg to stand on, you argue process. I'll note for the record that there isn't any member in, on this committee on the other side of the aisle that has argued uh, that Marjorie Taylor Greene shouldn't be removed from her committee. You have not at all addressed the issue of whether 
we should remove her from her committee. You have only argued process. Unprecedented action by a member of Congress, which this certainly is, requires, necessitates an unprecedented response. It doesn't have to be this way, as has been noted throughout this hearing. The minority leader has the opportunity to take action himself. In fact, the members of the Republican conference could have enough strength to urge your steering and policy committee to take action, but you have not. In the face of a global pandemic and in the wake of a devastating attack on our capital and our democracy, we're facing another unprecedented and divisive moment which threatens this nation. And I want to look at the facts. I know they've been gone over, but I think it's important for us to review them clearly. Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene has advocated for execution of leadership of this House, of a former president of the United States and other political adversaries. She's encouraged violence against law enforcement, an utterance no member can condone or continue to stand by. We paid tribute to a slain Capitol Police officer this morning, and just yesterday, two FBI agents were tragically murdered in the course of their duties in my own congressional district. Not satisfied with engaging in sedition, she has a well-documented record of making repeated racist, anti-Semitic, and Islamophobic comments. She has spread baseless and cruel conspiracy theories, even claiming, as has been noted, that the horrific shootings at Sandy Hook Elementary and Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School were staged. She has personally, herself, stalked and verbally assaulted a young survivor of one of those tragedies and called him a coward as he was preparing to visit this capital to plead for legislation. He was 18 years old at the time. Her bizarre claims include blaming the 2018 Camp Fire wildfire in California on a Jewish space laser and dabbling in 9-11 trutherism. Congresswoman Green's dangerous commentary continues to endanger, threaten, and inflict pain on a gamut of vulnerable communities. And that includes the colleagues and staff of the very house she serves in, who were just attacked last month by, among other Trump loyalists, the QAnon adherents she associated with. Confronted with her statements and actions in recent weeks, as a sitting member of this body, since she joined the Congress, Congresswoman Green has expressed no remorse, none. Worse, she now stands by nearly all of these statements, saying just today, we know who they all are, we owe them no apologies, we will never back down. She remains a clear and present danger to our democracy. Congresswoman Green's support for violence, pattern of stalking and intimidation, continued an unending pattern of appalling viciousness, lies, and racism, both before and after her election, is what helps fuel domestic terrorism, like we have all just witnessed up close. Her statements and actions bring shame on the entire House of Representatives and have fomented divisions within Congress and the United States as a whole. I filed this resolution to remove Congresswoman Taylor Green from her committee assignments, both on the House Education and Labor and the House Budget Committee. This has become necessary because the House of Representatives is a collegial body, one in which we succeed when we can work together to solve problems, even when we disagree. This is not about whether we find Marjorie Taylor Green's speech offensive. The point here is that she has promoted and advocated violence. She has herself stalked and intimidated those with whom she disagrees. In short, she is harmful to others and harmful to the House of Representatives and our ability to function normally. We need our elected leaders to rise to the immense challenges we face as a nation at a time when we must solve them with fact, ethical behavior, and respect. Lies, bigotry, and conspiracy theories cannot be sanctioned instead of peddled in these hallowed halls. Based on her actions and statements and her belligerent refusal to dis disavow them, she should not be permitted to participate in the important work of House committees. Reducing the future harm and disgrace she can cause in Congress and to the people of this nation by denying her a seat at committee tables where fact-based policies will be debated and crafted is both a suitable punishment and a necessary and proper restraint of her influence. The minority party should protect our ability to do the people's work and to take a stand against what we all agree is harmful and brings shame on the House. But if they refuse, the House as a whole must step in. Facts, evidence, and moral thoughtful arguments will lead to the valuable truths that make this nation stronger. Lies, hate-filled conspiracy theories, and disinformation like those that Congresswoman Green propagates will always breed disorder. Marjorie Taylor Green chose her destructive path. She chose to deliberately lie and to foment violence. And once elected, she chose to stand by those words and actions, and today, Today, she doubled down. Now that she's made those choices, 
the House must choose to limit the harm she can cause going forward in this body. We can take an important step toward restoring integrity and truth in this House by removing Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene from our committee assignments. While it is an action that we do not take lightly, it is the necessary course of action in the face of her extraordinary behavior, unbecoming of a member of Congress. Thank you for the opportunity to present the Rules Committee. Well, first of all, Ms. Washington Schultz, I want to thank you for your for your testimony and for your leadership on this issue. Um, I have uh, I have made my views on on this matter pretty clear. Um, so um, I will um, I will withhold any further comment at the moment. But uh, let me ask my my Republican colleagues any questions on the Republican side. Mr. Rush. Uh, thank thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. Um, no comments. I would just say this: I, there has been talk about process and Republicans bringing up process. Uh, this this committee is a process committee. Uh, process is actually important because process is how we protect the integrity of the institution. I've already brought up a statute of limitations issue, which which frankly needs to be addressed if we go down this that route. Again, I'm not saying one way or the other how we proceed, but if we do proceed, we do need to address the statute of limitations argument, uh, jurisdiction issues with ethics committee, whether or not there's issues with incoming candidates. And further, we also have to keep in mind that this will set an issue where the majority is telling the minority who sits on committees. You can argue if that is presidential or not, but there will come a time where the gavel will change um, so process is important because it protects the sanctity of the institution and stabilizes the institution as we change from party to party. With that said, I'll yield back. So I, I thank the gentleman for his comments. And uh, yes, this is a uh, rules committee does deals with a lot of process. And I think that what we're doing here today is actually giving more process to this issue than it would receive if it was a privilege resolution um I, i'm not i don't the statute of limitations thing i don't i don't get because um as i pointed out earlier uh miss taylor green has doubled down um and made it clear that she won't uh that she has nothing uh, to uh, apologize for uh period so i think she is uh associated herself with those comments but let me just say this if the uh if if, if there's a change in Who's in charge here? I hope there is not, but if there is, and if there's a member of this body, Democrat or Republican, who advocates for the assassination of other members, you know what? I'll vote to expel, I will vote to get that person off of committees. As I said before, I personally believe uh, that the gentleman from Georgia should resign um, or be expelled from this place. Uh, but at a minimum, she ought not to be on the committees. And so if that's the standard that we're setting here, if that's the precedent, that if people are calling for the assassination of other members of this body, and if that's a disqualifier for serving a committee, I'm all for it, I'm fine with it. And I can live with that. And I think it's the, and, and it's the, and boy, that's the, it, that shouldn't even be controversial. I mean, has anybody on the uh, democratic side have any questions? I think we're, I want to thank Ms. Wasserman Schultz for her testimony, um, and I will see her on the House floor tomorrow. Thank you. Thank All you, right. members. Um, I now want to welcome our next panel, Representative Brian Babin of Texas. I want to thank you for submitting your testimony, for providing to the testimony today. Um, any written materials you submit to the rule, to rules, documents at mail.house.gov before the conclusion of this hearing will, without objection, be entered into the record. I now recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Babin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it very much, this opportunity. Let me begin by telling the people watching at home a little bit about this Rules Committee and what's going on here today. House Republicans have 211 members, 48.5% of the 435 seats in this August body. But on this committee, which decides what bills will come to the floor and what amendments will come up for a vote, we have only four members to the majority's nine. So the outcome of my amendment has already been decided and was never in doubt. It seems to be a show trial, plain and simple. It's also an open secret that this committee works at the direction of the Speaker of the House. That's an important distinction. She is not just the Speaker of the Democratic Caucus. To the committee, I say this, the action that you are preparing to take will shatter our institutional norms and precedent 
And there is certainly even concern on your side that what goes around will come around the next time that you are in the minority. I think the best thing any of you could do is to make a motion to adjourn this hearing right now and to get back to something that actually matters. But that won't happen, I'm aware. But if you're going to take this action and declare that each party is no longer responsible for keeping their own house in order and that it falls upon the entire body to attend to this matter, you should lead by example. I'm not here to speak on Mrs. Green's behalf. She deserves and will continue to do so for her constituents, our Republican conference, and to the American people. But I will say that this is her first month on the job. She deserves the opportunity to do her duties, to let her employers, her constituents that is, decide next year whether to hire her again. Clause one of rule 23 of the rules of the House of Representatives provides a member, delegate, resident commissioner, officer or employee of the house shall behave at all times in a manner that shall reflect credibly on the house. This provision was also cited specifically in House Resolution 72. Representative Green was not a member of the House when she said many, if not all, of the statements that led to this course of action. However, Representative Omar has been sworn in for three months when she said that the Council on Islamic American Relations was founded after 9-11 because they recognized that some people did something, unquote. There are two glaring errors here. First, CARE was founded in 1994. Secondly, on 9-11 wasn't just something that some people did something. It was the brutal murder of nearly 3,000 Americans by 19 radical Islamic terrorists. And this very capital may have been the next target had four of those terrorists not been thwarted by the heroes of United Flight 93. Unfortunately, I could go on with the near constant litany of wildly offensive anti-Semitic America is a bad guy rhetoric that, pre that Representative Omar has espoused both before and during her time in Congress. The majority is seeking to hold Representative Green to the standards of the House rules for her conduct and words while she was a private citizen. But they have said nothing and will do nothing about Representative Omar's conduct and words while she's been in office. I don't doubt that many of you believe that you are defending this institution with this vote. But now if you can prove it by going off the script, this hearing is supposed to follow by voting your conscience to make my amendment in order. Please take off your partisan blinders Hold your colleague to account for the shameful conduct she has exhibited while wearing one of these pins, and then maybe we can talk about Mrs. Green. With that, Mr. Chairman, I will yield back. So I thank the gentleman for his, uh, his testimony. Um, he is right, this is the Rules Committee, and the gentleman's been around since, what, he got, he got elected, came here in 2015, if I'm not mistaken. I did, I came in in 2015. Right, and uh, so the gentleman knows that the Rules Committee has to follow the rules. The gentleman provided an amendment to the Rules Committee. I'm sure his staff must have checked with the parliamentarian, is not germane. Uh, so we don't normally make non-germane amendments in order. We never do. Uh, so I put that, I point that out for, uh, for the record. Uh, secondly, um, I, I, and you know, I don't really know the gentleman but I would just say um, it is clear that we don't share the same values. Um, and uh, it, is, it is really um, amazing to me uh, that you would come before this committee and present uh, what you just presented um, and not at all be bothered by a single thing that uh, Ms. Taylor Green has said, including uh, advocating for the assassination of members of this Congress. But you are always welcome here, even though I strongly disagree with what you were saying here. Um, let me ask the, on the Republican side, is there any questions of uh, Mr. Babin? Mr. Thank Chairman. you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. Um, I would just like to thank my colleague, the good doctor from Texas, from coming, for coming to the committee and to see if he would have anything to add. Thank you very much, uh, Guy. Appreciate you. Mr. Chairman, I would say that we probably do share our values. However, 
you can't wear blinders and see one side of the table and not see the other side. Because that is not the only quote that Mrs. Omar has made in her time and her tenure in Congress. I've got a list here that I could go down. There are 11 quotes, 11 instances where she has made anti-Semitic tropes. And I, I don't recall ever seeing uh, the Rules Committee Institute a proceeding against her. We haven't even seen anything said against her by, uh, by the Speaker of the House. Uh, she, has, uh, she has retracted partially some of these, but others she has doubled down on. And I could, I could read these if, you're, if you will indulge me. Mr. Rushenthaler has the time. If he wants to indulge you, he can. I would. Um, I, I would. I would just ask my colleague uh, from Texas um, if we could. If we could just move on, if you don't mind, and we cannot uh, go through. The, I understand uh, the point you're trying to make, but for the uh, just sake of moving this along, I'd, I'd ask you to refrain if that if that is okay with you. That's fine with me. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Doctor Babs. Okay. Anybody, you're welcome. Anybody, thank you. anybody on the Democratic side have a question? Um, Mr. Chairman, Ms. Tor Ms. Torres. Uh, perhaps you can uh, explain uh, or define what germane means just to make sure that the general public who has been spoken to by our witness truly understand what we're talking about here. So let me read from the rule. Uh, germane is no motion or proposition on a subject different from that under consideration shall be admitted under color of amendment. I mean, that is the title. So this is not, uh, this is not relevant. This is not germane to the underlying bill. And again, the parliamentarian would have, um, I'm sure if it was, if we, if you check with the parliamentarian would have told you that, but anyway, Ms. Torres, any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to make sure that all of our members are um, fully informed of what all these terms are that are being thrown out. And yeah. I reel back. Mr. Chair, if I might, Perlmutter. Yep. Uh, Dr. Babin is a friend of mine, and I am Try. disappointed in, in his testimony today. And I think the thing that I'm concerned about, I'd say to my friend, is the Republican conference uh, placed Ms. Green on the Labor and Education Committee, knowing full well that she doubts and has uh, said that the shootings in Florida and in Connecticut, and I don't know where else, uh, Las Vegas apparently were all staged. But certainly at the schools in Florida and in uh, Connecticut, that is, uh, you know, you've been in, you, you've run an office. I was in leadership in my uh, state legislature in the state Senate, never, would we pick anybody? I mean, I don't know that I've ever had anybody like that, but we certainly wouldn't put her, put somebody like that on labor and education, period. And she has no business. I mean, just that alone uh, sets up this whole thing. And I, I've heard your testimony and you wanna try to equate uh, Rep uh, Omar with, with what's going on here, but this started by the selection of Miss Green, who questions these shootings that we all know ex happened, to put her on labor and education. That is the whole point here to my friend. And I, I don't, uh, if you want to respond to that, feel, feel free. But that's what's got me so upset, period. Well, if I may respond, Mr. Chairman, I, I consider Ed Perlmutter a very, very good friend. Uh, over the years that I've served with him on uh, space and science, we have similar loves and likes, and uh, we've traveled together, and uh, I really appreciate that, uh, and I appreciate what you're saying, and I'm not here to address the, uh, the supposed uh, uh, statements by Mrs. Green. Uh, I have understood uh, that she has retracted uh, some of these statements. I am not versed up in them, and so I'm not here to talk about her, okay? I'm here to, to make sure that what's good for the goose is good for the gander. 
And when the when when the chairman says that I don't have the same, he doesn't have the same values, or I don't have the, his same values, I can tell you that we 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 probably most certainly have the same values, but we cannot pick and choose uh, one side that may be the opponent's side and not look and see, just like it says in the Bible, if you have a speck in your eye, don't have, don't criticize someone for the speck in his eye if you've got a log in yours. And we've got, you have problems on your side as well that have not been addressed. And that is what this this uh, this amendment is all about. So Ed, I would uh, I, I would just tell you that I appreciate what you just said, and I understand the uh, you know the, the high feelings on on both sides here. So with that, I'll just yield back. Mr. Mr. Chairman, can I just jump in real fast? Um, let, me just, let's make, let me make sure the pro letter is finished. Yeah, I'm sorry. I I yield to Mr. Rushenthaler. Thank you, Mr. Perlmutter. Uh Mr. Perlmutter has said that. Dr. Badman is his friend. Dr. Badman said that uh, Mr. Perlmutter is his friend. I want to say for the record that I consider Mr. Perlmutter a friend, but he'd be a better friend if he invited me skiing at some point in his home state of Colorado. And with that, I would yield back. Okay. And yeah, it's, I, on I, I yield, it's on the record. It's on the record, Ed. I, I, you got it. I yield back to Thank the you. chair. Any other buddy, anyone else on the Democratic side um, looking for um, recognition? Let me, let me just say, um, Mr. Bevan, I, the, the false equivalence that you have just presented to us, to me, is unbelievable. Um, and um, the controversial remarks that Ms. Omar has made, she's apologized for. Um, and, um, and she's actually engaged uh, Jewish leaders in her community and around the country. Um, and, um, you know, the, um, and, and you're not here picking, you, you are here picking and choosing, because what you are, your amendment would do is exonerate Ms. Green. I mean, you're, you, 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 this is not an and, this is, you know, you, you, have, you have exonerated her. Um, and, um, and the deal- I'm not here to talk about her, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Well, well you, you defend, defend, this is what this hearing is about. Um, I don't know if you got the notice, but that's what this hearing is about. And the bottom line is that, um, uh, you know, you have come with a resolution that essentially exonerates her. Um, and so I, I, you know, I, I look at, I mean, whatever. Um, appreciate your, your being here. I don't, um, I don't have anything else I want to add. Uh, does anyone have, to have a, anyone else have a question? Seeing none, I, I'd like to thank our witness for his testimony. You're now excused. Um, are there any other members who wish to testify on HRES uh, 72? Um, seeing none. Um, that this closes the hearing on HRS 72. Uh, at this time, I'll entertain a, a motion from the gentlewoman from uh, California, Mrs. Torres. Mr. Chairman, I move the committee grant HRS 72, removing a certain member from certain standing committees of the House of Representatives, a closed rule. The rule provides one hour of debate, equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the committee on ethics. The rule waives all points of order against consideration of the resolution. The rule provides that the resolution shall be considered as read. Uh, I yield heard, back. Thank you. You've heard the uh, motion from the gentleman from California. Is there any amendment or discussion? Let me, let me, before we vote, let me just say one, one final thing. Um, as I said before, um, none of us are happy about gathering and having this hearing and then having to report this uh, resolution out to the floor. We had hoped that the Republican leadership would have dealt with this. Uh, for whatever reason, they don't want to deal with it. Um, and, uh, and that's unfortunate. And so we are taking this step. We have a process in place that is more of a process than it would normally be. Uh, and, um, and we will bring this to the floor, we will debate it, and we will vote on it. But again, I'm going to say, as I said before, the question we all have to ask each ourselves is, what is, what is the message? What is the consequence of doing nothing? And, um, you know, we've heard, again, all my Republican colleagues talk about 
I'll, they don't want to associate themselves with the remarks of Ms. Taylor Gray. I appreciate that, but it's not enough to just distance yourself from her remarks, given the gravity and the seriousness of what she has said. The real question is what action will you take? What we're doing here today is saying she does not have, she, she should not enjoy the privilege of serving on committees. That's what this is about. Uh, anybody who advocates assassinations of members of Congress or anybody, anybody who said what she has said about a whole range of things that we've heard them here today, I don't believe uh, should enjoy the privilege of being on a committee. And so now uh, the vote is, um, the, the, uh, is there any other discussion or amendment? Hearing none, the question is now on the motion offered by the gentlewoman from California. All those in favor will say aye. 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 Opposed, no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it and the motion is agreed to. Uh, uh, accordingly, I will manage this for the majority. Mr. Rushadala, who? Yes, Mr. Chairman, it's going to be Mr. Cole uh, managing for us. And Mr. Cole will manage it for the uh, minority. I thank everybody for uh, being here today. And without objection, the committee is adjourned.